All right, welcome to lecture 8.1. I'm going to continue along with the mass distribution topics, and uh, we're going to introduce uh, the so-called inertia dyadic, as well as a few other theorems that you can make use of uh, when uh, calculating and using the inertia. So let's start here. Um, so yeah, I want to introduce this idea of the inertia dyadic. Okay, we've had an inertia vector and inertia scalars in the last lecture, but um, there's going to be a more convenient way uh, and a more universal way to express the mass distribution of a set of particles or a rigid body. So if I have such a distribution of particles, and I'll sort of bound this so it looks like a rigid body. Uh, this applies to both rigid bodies uh, of continuous distribution or um, uh, a set of particles. And uh, the only difference is, is whether or not you are making use of the um, summations or integral forms of the equations. So I'll have a point O here, and R from PI, from O to PI, all the different particles in this body. And then I'm also going to include um, a local reference frame, and this will be B. I can make that in blue too, so that's clear that's the same. And um, we'll have uh, the X by bc. So we're going to express our vectors in that coordinate frame. Um, we know already that we can create three, um, uh, well, we can create an inertia vector. And if I think only about these mutually perpendicular unit vectors, I could create an inertia vector about each one. So for example, um, we could find I, uh, with respect to Bx, of B with respect to point O, we can find them similarly, I with respect to By, of B, the set of particles, or rigid body with respect to O, and then finally, I, C. So, these are uh, redundant, right? They all capture the entire distribution of the particles, um, with respect to uh, of the system, but each of them are tied to what we would say a different basis that uh, vector either bx, by, or bz. Um, if I take these three, I can make some obvious um, calculations to arrive at some inertia scalars. So if I dot each of them with the same vector, I would get uh, an ixx, an iyy, and an izz inertia vector. But then I also can make products of uh, uh, inertia between the mutually perpendicular unit vectors. And that would let me then arrive at um, all of the uh, pairs. So if I uh, take the ixx, I can get an ixy and an ixz. And for the iyy, if I dot with uh, first x, I'll get y x, and then y, z, and then similarly I can dot uh, z with x, and uh, the z with y. So I can get these products of inertia. Um, now I have uh, the moments of inertia here, uh, x, x, y, y, and z, z, and then these products of inertia. And if you recall, uh, which I didn't think I talked about that in the last lecture, but it's in the online notes, um, it's always true that uh, any given product of inertia, I, X, Y, is going to be equal to I, uh, Y, X. Okay, so these off, uh, these terms are equal to uh, these terms in that sense. So see the notes for that. So what we have here are six uh, unique inertia scalars with some of them being redundant um, for the body or 
set of particles. B, okay, uh, about O, or with respect to O. These are typically then presented space as a matrix or a tensor. So I of B with respect to O. Um, you have a three by three matrix here of these inertia tensors. It is symmetric. and often called the inertia matrix or inertia tensor. Okay. Um, the rows and axes are associated with the x, y, and z unit vectors of this body B. And then remember it all, it is all with respect to the point O2 that we calculate these numbers. So, uh, and I'll put a subscript B so we know that that's tied to this reference frame and the unit vectors of B. So this should look familiar from your prior dynamics class. We can use the principles of the inertia vector to arrive at an inertia matrix. Now, we've also been working with vectors. So I call this thing an inertia tensor. Okay, it's actually a second order tensor because it's a matrix and um, first order tensors tensors we've already been working with if I have some vector V and I have a column vector we'll called VX VY VC also expressed in the B frame I can then write a first order tensor this vector um, in that form and that's analogous to this uh, tensor form here of the uh, inertia matrix. So, Paul. Okay, so sorry, I had a little pause there in the video, but uh, first order tensors, I just wanted to make sure I realized my cursor wasn't being displayed. But uh, we have first order tensors here, vectors, and, and re recall that we can, uh, we've been writing them though in this form. So we can write the measure number um, with the uh, unit vector of interest, and we get then a component of that vector. And um, we can also do this with the second order tensors. And um, the idea that I want to introduce here is the concept of a dyadic. So just like that, we wrote that vector in a different form. Uh, instead of a column matrix, I have this uh, other form that we've been using. A dyadic is the analogous form for second order tensors. So a dyadic lets us write second order tensors in this uh, same way as the vectors. Okay. So if I were to write that inertia matrix that I showed above, it's a dyadic, it's going to look something like this. So I use the um, Breva, uh, Breva uh, accent here for dyadics. Okay, uh, it's still of the body B with respect to O. So we'll keep that in there, but I will then make a summation of terms that look like so.
Okay, so now I've got something that looks like that vector, but we have these uh, terms here. Instead of unit vectors, I've got these a unit vector multiplied by a unit vector. Okay, these are still scalars. These are dyadics, and they're the simplest dyadics, and I'll explain what I mean by that. But uh, for example, bx bx um, is actually the outer product operation between these two vectors. And you can take the outer product of any two vectors. Here we have two unit vectors. In the notes, um, I use the O times symbol there to represent that. But I want uh, in the in the notes here because it's just uh, has to make forces you to write a little bit more. So these are equivalent, and you'll see the O times in the notes. And then Simpy Mechanics also prints the O times symbol there. Okay. So the outer product is really the matrix product of two vectors. So um, if I have 1, 0, 0 as my vector in B, and I outer product that with a 1, 0, 0, the same vector in B, then you transpose the second one and you take the matrix product and you will end up with a 3 by 3 matrix that looks like so. Right. So notice, just like a unit vector has the single one and two, two zeros, we have, still have a single one and all zeros in this new three by three vector. We're going to call this kind of vector, where there's only a, a single one in one of the entries, a unit dyad. So just like a unit vector, we have a unit dyad that represents the unit element of a three by three or a second order tensor here. Okay. So this is analogous to the unit vector. Analogous to a unit vector for vectors. Right. Um, you can also, though, write any unit vector times any unit vector to also get a unit dyad. So if I had some other reference frame, this would also be a unit dyad. And maybe you can see then that I can uh, write, I can write dyads if I want in terms of any unit dyads I want, so even if they're expressed in different uh, unit vectors from different reference frames. So in the same way we could do that with vectors, we're, we'll be able to do that with tensors. And that um, can sometimes is useful. Um, so um, another uh, thing, I think I need a new page. I don't know. Um, another thing, too, is there's uh, the so-called unit dyadic. Okay, so not a unit dyad, that's just this, but a unit dyadic, and I'm going to, I'll use capital U with the Breva accent there. Um, if we have the three unit, uh, maybe you'll call it the central unit dyads there of B. So this is a unit dyad, and it represents, if we had uh, each of these, you would see then a one on the diagonals here. So this represents the identity matrix. Okay. And B. And that um, identity matrix is equivalent in any frame. So a unit dyadic, doesn't matter which frame you write it in, uh, it's always the same thing. So if I had AXX uh, plus AYY plus AZZ, it's equal to uh, this. So the unit dyadic is a useful construct too. So we've got unit dyads and unit dyadics, and then an arbitrary dyadic, which is just the outer product of two vectors, okay? So, the um, just like with vectors, we can write 
them in terms of different reference frames. Okay, so right, I could have some vector w, uh, a scalar times a unit vector in b, plus another scalar times a unit vector in d, plus a new, another scalar times a unit vector in f. Okay, so we can write vectors like this: combinations of unit vectors expressed in different reference frames, and the you know rotations between those two are uh, inherent to expression here. So it's also true for dyadics. Um, if I write some dyadic Q, we could imagine I have a scalar times the unit dyad in uh, Bx. But you could also write unit dyads that are combinations of different reference frame unit vectors. We can have other unit, uh, other reference frames here, and etc. So that is a valid uh, dyadic here that's made up of um, di unit dyads times scalars from different reference frames. Right. So um, that's potentially useful, can help you with this. In this, just like the vector, manages right this this form has the uh like you could say it has the rotation matrices of these relative frames sort of built in to the equation and we can always express this in any reference frame we want we can also express any dyadic in any reference frame we want okay so uh that um becomes useful too and um the uh, transformation there, I'll, I'll, I'll show that later, but um, that uh, as well, I'll leave it at right now. I'll give you a more explicit example in a minute. But the uh, notes has um, some properties of dyadics or identities, just like we have with vectors. See notes uh, for dyadic identities. Okay. Key one though is you can dot vectors with dyadics, okay? And they will give you a vector uh, as a result of that. The um, these though are not uh, commutative. So this does not equal uh, that dyadic Q dotted with V, right? So they don't commute in general, right? But if I have a unit dyadic, right? So U is the unit dyadic, um, that dot product does commute, right? Because it's just the identity matrix. And it also will end up that we do, that is equals to V anyways. So that's the unit dyadic there. But you can uh, take dot products, cross products, multiply by scalars, uh, and you can check the rules there in the notes. But uh, keep this is one main one to uh, be aware of. It the you can't uh, just swap those dot products as you're doing your algebraic relations or your dyadic relations. Okay. All right, so we've got this idea of a dyadic, um, and there's a special dyadic we're going to deal with called the inertia dyadic. So um, I've already told you in the last lesson, and I mentioned at the beginning of this one, that some any given inertia vector holds all the information about the mass distribution and that means too that it holds all the moments and products of inertia 
of that system B of particles or rigid body. Um, but it's dependent on this in a unit vector, right? That's what this uh, a there represents. So um, this idea of a dyadic, uh, we can actually transform this into in something in terms of a dyadic that will let us not have to worry about this basis vector or this vector in a, right, that we're building the inertia vector about, okay? And that's going to be convenient because uh, then we can describe a set of particles or rigid bodies uh, in a way that is not associated with any given basis. Uh, okay, so how do we do that? If I have this uh, inertia scalar, uh, sorry, inertia vector, Right, we know the definition that I presented in the last lecture, just for the collection of particles. Looks like this. All right. Um, there is a vector triple product identity. It will let us rewrite this expression. So it turns out that A crossed B cross C can be written as a uh, without cross products, but in terms of not products. If this is true, you can look that up um, and see how that comes about, but we can write these cross products in, uh, in terms of draw products. If we do that for our inertia vector here, then we get this. Okay, so here um, we now know that uh, a, make a uh, vector times a vector is a dyadic. So I have here vectors times vectors, and if I group those and do that operation before the dot, then I can get a dyadic term. So you can then further write this as... The, uh, this term, um, this dot product of the vector times itself is simply its magnitude. So I'll just write that as magnitude squared, actually, magnitude squared. And then I'll come back to this term, but here I've got these two uh, vectors. We're going to have the outer product of those two vectors, right? I'll just group those, and then that will be dotted with an A. So here I have a dyadic. Right, times a vector, or dotted with a vector, which would give me a vector here uh, in whole. Uh, over here, I've got a, a scalar times a vector, which is just a vector, but I, if I want to have a similar term here, I need to be a dyadic. Well, I can make use of our unit dyadic, right? Because that doesn't change anything. But uh, now I can write this expression in terms of dyadics, okay? Right? And this would be a, a vector in that case, okay? Um, finally, if I, I can factor out this uh, in A here, okay? So I've got the unit dyadic. I can move it to any side, uh, but I can't over here. Uh, 
I can then arrive at a BO equals um, move in A to the right here. Can't move that one. So we can then get uh, the sum I equals 1 to new of um, R P I respect to O squared times U, the unit dyadic, and I will put square brackets here, minus so and then uh, big parentheses the whole thing uh, if I pull out the dot in a then I have um, a dyadic here dotted with an a to get that inertia vector well this piece I'm running out of space but this piece is what we're going to use is the inertia dyadic contains all the information about the inertia of B with respect to O uh, without needing to have an A in the picture. So go to a new page. Um, we then have that I with respect to A, B, O is going to equal um, I because it dyadic dotted with in a Did I that correct look I might I may be making a mistake mistake whether the in a is the beginning or or pre-multiplied or post modified Did I get that right you get to b times yeah because the one on the right is the unit dyadic one that I can move and I can't. So I, th I think I have that correct now. Um, but if not, I'll, I'll let you all know. So anyways, uh, this term right, is this uh, inertia dyadic. And um, I could steal it from above or show the above. So we have, uh, how do you define the inertia dyadic? Well, the sum of the mass particles times this uh, magnitude of the vector to each particle from O times the unit acted minus the uh, outer product between the vectors there. So you can calculate this. And this inertia dyadic is um, nice to work with because we don't have to worry about that in a unit vector. So um, this IO uh, inertia dyadic contains all the moments and products of inertia. Also, B with respect to the point O. Um, in a basis independent way. All right? And that just means that in A or any other unit vector there is not inherently needed. And we can write these dyadics in terms of any reference frames that we want. Okay? Uh, so all of that can be in any reference frame, which is convenient. Uh, the dyadic that I showed you before for inertia is a valid inertia dyadic. It's a... Uh, I won't write the whole thing, but it uh, looked like so. So we had this inertia dyadic that captured all of the moments and products of inertia. 
and that is a valid inertia dyadic. Um, and then if the point O uh, is BO with a mass center of B, and you have B with respect to BO, uh, we call this the central inertia dyadic. Because it's with respect to the mass center. So, in general, we're going to use this inertia dyadic term um, to work with unit vectors. I'm sorry, do you work with inertia of objects? Its base is independent. If you want to transform it into a uh, uh, inertia vector, then you can dot it with the vector of interest. And if you want a particular inertia scale, then you can you can dot again. But uh, this gives us a way to describe inertia more universally. So what are some things we can do with that? Um, the First is that uh, you know we talked about expressing these dyadics in different reference frames, so you can express an inertia dyadic in any reference frame. Um, what this is equivalent to is if I had an inertia matrix with respect to the unit vectors of the A-frame, and I want to transform that from an inertia matrix, sorry, B here, uh, if I want to transform that from an inertia matrix expressed in the A-frame, you can do so by pre and post multiplying by the transformation matrices that we have learned about before. Um, but here we pre-multiply and then post-multiply by the transpose. And that gives you a similar equivalence that we saw with uh, vectors, which were um, some, unit ve some vector in B. Let's say that. Uh, equals uh, C, B, A. Some, unit ve some vector in A. So that's the same transformation that will happen behind the scenes. And um, in simplified mechanics, you use this same dot express method to manage that. Right? So dyadics also have that. Let me hop over to Jupiter. Didn't find my mouse. Always disappears. There we go. So, let's call this um, inertia, save, and get some imports here. All right, um, let me just show you express. So let's create two reference frames. I'll call it uh, A and B. And we could orient B with respect to A. And uh, let's get some symbols here. Let's, let's call theta equals Theta and yeah, I think that's all we need for here. So let's just do a simple rotation and we'll rotate about theta y. Okay, so we set up that orientation and then um, we can actually create a, a dyadic 
So I'll call it Q and I'll just use numbers for the scalar. So I'll say three um, and times, and then we have an outer product that lets us multiply different uh, unit vectors. So let's do BX and uh, AZ. And then I can just create various unit dyads like, like this, unit X, unit X plus six times e dot outer. And then we'll do a dot z and a dot z. Okay. So I created that q looks like so. So we see these outer products, these then are the unit dyads, and we get some value there. I can express this. terms of A, a caps lock on in terms of A, okay, um, or B in that case. And that gives me the two um, versions uh, expressed only in the unit dyads of that particular reference frame. Uh, similarly, if I use the two matrix method, just like we had with vectors, you can see that in this matrix form. It manages the representation. So if you need to rotate inertia dyadics or any other dyadic, uh, express them in different frames, you can do so uh, like so. And it's managing that uh, double matrix multiplication that I show in the notes there. So that's hopefully useful. And the next thing is I want to introduce, we talked about uh, Newton and uh, Euler's second laws. So let me just get a new page. Both of those had the, one had the linear moment and one had the angular moment. And I showed you an equation for the angular momentum at that time, but it didn't explain it fully. But the angular momentum of a collection of particles or a rigid body P is defined like so. So I can say the angular momentum of somebody B with respect to a point O in the reference frame A is equal to and this is a definition, um, the unit, I'm sorry, the inertia dyadic of B with respect to O dotted with the angular velocity vector of that body B in A, okay? So this is the angular momentum. Of B, about point O in reference frame A. Okay, so the, the dyadic makes that for a nice operation. Dotting uh, inertia dyadic with the angular velocity gives us angular momentum. Now, you can also use the, you can use any point you want for the angular momentum. Let's use the mass center of B. And if we do that, then we the same equation. And this is called the central angular momentum. Because it's with respect to the mass center. Right? So that's all it is to it to get to angular momentum. If you have uh, your inertia dyadic properly defined and an angular velocity vector, you then have angular momentum, and it is a vector that comes out of that. Um, so uh, that's all it is to that. I'll show you that on Jupiter in just one second, but let's first also introduce this idea of principal axes. So you sort of learned about this uh, concept too in your um, dyna prior dynamics courses, but uh, if 
the products of inertia. Are zero for body B um, expressed in the unit vectors of B uh, well, that's not what it was. Uh, if the products in issue, issue are zero for a body B, I think that's all I want to say, sorry, that uh, expressed about any set of mutually perpendicular unit vectors, let's just say about any mutually perpendicular unit vectors, then um, your inertia dyadic would be quite simple. So for example, if I write the in central inertia dyadic, some scalar I have a moment of inertia, I have a V1 axis, a V2, axes, and these aren't necessarily the um, standard or arbitrary set of uh, unit vectors for that frame, but they're in fact a special set, then here, um, if there's no products of inertia, then we have an inertially symmetric object. with respect to V1, V2, V3, whatever those mutually perpendicular unit vectors are. Um, uh, if this is the case, then we get to call those vectors the uh, principal axes. of body B. And these scalars associated with them, I1, 1, I2, 2, and I3, 3, are the principal moments of inertia. So we only have moments of inertia right? So uh, every collection of points or set of points, or any rigid body has principal axes that you can find. And I show in the notes how you find those. You can solve an eigenvalue problem to find these. Um, the eigenvectors end up being these principal axes directions, or these unit vectors. And the scalars end up being the eigenvalues of the 3x3 three three inertia matrix. But there is a set of uh, axes such that the products of inertia go to zero for any rigid body. If uh, you have a geometrically symmetric object that is also um, uniformly dense, then uh, those are going to align, these axes are going to align with planes of symmetry, or be normal to planes of symmetry of the object. Um, but if you can express your inertia like this, it's much simpler. And um, it also makes your angular momentum simpler, and then uh, we'll have some consequences too. So let me show via Jupiter uh, an idea here. Uh, so let's go here. And recall uh, Euler's second law which we wrote as the time derivative of the angular momentum must be equal to the sum of all uh, moments acting on that body. So this is orders all for a single rigid body. And um, let me introduce some terms. I'm going to put some uh, 
scalars here to be the measure numbers of a sum of the moments vector. And they can be dynamic. And then I'll make a sum of the moments m equals m1. Uh, I guess I want to create. Um, we've got we've got a and b already. So let me actually let me just redo that. Reference frame A, and then we'll have body or reference frame B. Okay, and um, here I'm just going to make an arbitrary angular velocity vector with scalars omega two, omega three. And those are going to be dynamic symbols also. One. Let's make that omega so it looks like I want. Make omega one. Make it our omega two. And omega three. All right. So let's create all those, and then I'll create a angular velocity vector. So I have angular velocity of b and a, and that's going to be one. And we'll express it in the body's reference frames. Two times b dot y and w three times b dot c. So that's our angular velocity vector there. And then I will have a sum of all of the moments acting on this single rigid body. I'll just call that capital M. And I express that also in the unit vectors of the body. Don't see. Okay, so we've got, this is the left-hand side of uh, the Euler equation that I show, and then I've got the ingot velocity. Now we want to get a inertia dyadic. So, um, Let's make the, the the central inertia dyadic um, about the principal axes in this case. So that means that we get to get away with I11, I2, and I33 as our only scalars. Those are going to be constant. So I11, I2. Three, three. Right. And then let's create that inertia dyadic, central inertia dyadic here. Um, we'll have I equals I11, one, one, and then times ME dot outer, and then we're having a central inertia dyadic expressed in the V frame also. So we do X plus I22 two, two, times me dot outer by comma b y plus i three three times me dot outer b z comma b z. Let's look at that inertia dynamic. There we go. So now I have pieces of the puzzle. We know that the angular momentum, the central angular momentum in this case, is going to be quite simple. We'll have I and then I'll do an ME dot I with a omega omega V and A. Okay. And I can take the time derivative of that. Well, we know that um, omega changes with time, I doesn't, but also these will change with respect to time in A. Right, and the um, if I do h dot diff, and uh, let's get t first. We need that dynamic symbols t, and then h dot diff t. Um, oh yeah, in a right. Am I messing up? Yeah, 
it is uh, the bar, the variable in the frame, right? I type that wrong. So T in A, and I think I have to have the orientations set there. Why do I have to have the orientation set? We can solve this a little easier, right? I can say that a dot diff t in a plus omega crossed h, right? So I can we can write that a w v. So then I'll do m e dot cross h. So that's an equivalent statement. We don't need to have the orientation specified and that should give me the angular momentum no connecting path we got everything expressed in b oh this is supposed to be b there we go all right so now i have um, h dot right is this the correct form of h dot and we know that that has to be equal to these moments. So we say that um, M, and I'll just do minus H dot is supposed to be equal to zero for the other second law. And there we go. So we have this equation. Um, we could also write it as just for it to display in matrix form. If I do two matrix B, and then I have H dot two matrix B. And then we can see for a central principal moments of inertia, this is Euler's second law for a single rigid body. Some of the moments here we have expressed as a single moment vector equals this right and we have these terms looks like i'm missing who am i missing i didn't get the i'm missing something here i don't have the uh this is supposed to have some dots in it So just not displaying correctly. Diff and B. Did I do omega omegas or dynamic symbols? Um, diff of T and B. Omega cross H. I've screwed up something here. What am I screwing up? Zero. Why did that go to zero? It's not supposed to be zero. Um, it should be omega dot, right? Omega. This is T and B. is uh, A B. Why is that zero? Shouldn't be zero. Missing something here. These are definitely dynamic symbols. W1 diff T. Oh, this is supposed to be dot underscore t. Oh, yeah, okay. All right, you can see how those aren't quite the same t. This is a gotcha. Let me just run all these again. Boom, boom, boom. Now, 
h dot looks right, and then I get the equation that I want. Okay, so this is the Euler's equation for a single rigid body that has the inertia expressed in principal axes here, uh, or that the principal axes are aligned with the bx, by, and bz is the, is the correct way to say that. And we can see that we get these uh, i11, the moment of inertia, times omega 1 dot, but then we have these other terms that have to do with these omega 2 times omega 3 um, terms. Okay, so it's not so simple that it's just i11 omega 1 dot, i22 omega 2 dot, i33 omega 3 dot. Um, you, uh, the derivative, the proper derivative here, will introduce these other terms. Okay. So that's what I wanted to show you, but that's how you, you know, can fundamentally use the dyadic to calculate the angular momentum. And then I took the time derivative of the angular momentum using our property here that we know about. And then I can form Euler's second law of motion. All right. Sorry for the little error of that there. Okay. I want to show one more thing. So one more example. We come back to the tablet the uh, I want to talk about the parallel axis theorem some of you may know that as Steiner's theorem or uh, I'm going to mispronounce this too obviously you can tell I won't be studying my Dutch I'm not studying my Dutch very well but uh, it's uh, Huygens theorem also famous Dutch um, scientists of the golden era. Um, but this uh, parallel axis theorem looks like so. I'm going to write it in terms of inertia dyadics. Parallel axis theorem helps us uh, find the inertia about some other point if we know the inertia about the um, the central inertia dyadic, right? So this is the inertia dyadic of V about some point O. And here uh, is the inertia dyadic specifically about its uh, mass center, the body B's mass center or the collection of particles mass center. So that's the central inertia dyadic of B. And uh, this term here, though, is um, relates the points O and BO. Okay, so we have to account for what is the effect of, of looking at the inertia about another point. And this this distance that we move from the central, the mass center to this other point. And there will be some inertia contributions associated with that. So this is actually the inertia dyadic of a particle of mass m, okay, which is the mass of B, body B, or collection of particles B, at point BO with respect to point O. Right. So this uh, term here, we can write that out using our definition of the inertia dyadic. And we'd have total mass of the body or the collection of particles. Um, and then I can, I only have one summation right here since it's a single particle. But I have the distance from O to BO, magnitude squared times the unit dyadic minus the outer product of BOO or BOO, just applying the definition of the inertia dyadic. So we can move, uh, express the inertia about a different point um, using this theorem, as long as you start with the central inertia dyadic. And of course, you can go the other way too, back to the central inertia dyadic. It doesn't work for any arbitrary two points, but you can go from the central inertia or back using this parallel axis theorem. And it writes quite uh, simply in uh, this inertia diet form. 
So let's do an example where we have to work with parallel axis theorem and some rotations. I'm going to create my favorite machine, bicycle. Yeah, it's going to be two wheels that aren't quite circles, I guess, but that's fine. And I have it sitting in the ground, and then I will shape a bicycle out of here, out of this. All right, so basic side view of a bicycle here. Um, the We're going to be given some information about the bicycle, some uh, information about its inertia. So I'm going to make a point O here, and then we have a couple of unit vectors to work with. Mutually perpendicular, we'll call this uh, the X of a bicycle and the Z. Yeah, and I want to draw to the uh, mass center of this bicycle, which we'll say is approximately here. And this is a standard symbol for the mass cent cent mass center of objects. And we call that VO. Okay. So this is the bike here is the body B, and we're giving given some properties of the bike. So I will move over here to this. We're going to be given the mass of the bike and 0.9 kilograms. Okay. We're going to be given the vector to the mass center from point O. R, B, O, respect to O. And uh, it's going to be 0.3 meters in the BX minus 0 0.5 meters in the BC. Okay, so this is meters, an expression, vector expression in meters. And then we're also given its um, central inertia dyadic. So B with respect to B O, and it'll be expressed in the unit vectors of B. Right? So that's going to be 0.5, so it has a moment inertia, 0.5 about the X, plus 1.3 by by about the y, uh, plus 0.8 the c, the c. And then it has a couple of products of inertia terms too. All right, so we've got some information about the bicycle. Now, uh, I'll draw in, in green. We're going to have a rider, which we'll also have some information, uh, inertial information about, but it's expressed uh, in different reference frames in respect to different points. Right? Maybe you measure the inertia of the human separately than the inertia of the rider uh, or the bike. And let's make a little head here. All right, so I've got some rider here, and uh, we'll call that rider, oops, H, okay? And for the rider, we have uh, his, his or her mass center. It's up here somewhere. Um, and then I'll have some unit vectors. So we happen to get the rider's information. Oops, it is vertical. With expressed with respect to these unit vectors. And this one is going to be H Z, I believe, and H Y. Okay. 
All right, so I have the unit vectors for H, and then we're also given some information about the human. So similarly, we're going to get a mass of the human. I'll we'll call that 84 kgs. Oh, yeah, and I've got the units of uh, the inertia dyadic scalars are uh, going to be um, uh, kg meter squared. All right, so we have consistent units. And then we'll have R to HO, which I didn't label, uh, with respect to O. So conveniently, we also get that with respect to O already. We don't have to worry about that. Um, it's going to be uh, 0 0.4 and then Vx minus 1.1 and then Vz. Okay. And then we get um, an inertia dyadic for H, and we're going to also get the central inertia dyadic here of 11.3 HX HX plus uh, 11, I believe. I wrote that right. HY, HY. And Uh, the Z, 2.3, HC, HZ, and then we've got also product of inertia. And we only have these two product of inertia terms because um, we assume a plane of symmetry down the uh, plane that we are, are looking at. So that's HY, HZ. And then plus also 1.7, oh, those are minuses. These are minus, minus 1.7 HC HY. The last piece is that um, the way these two um, uh, sets of unit vectors relate to us, we also would know that. The direction cosine matrix between the two is going to be this. Okay, so that's the given information. And the question is what is the inertia of the bike and the rider combined about the new mass center? And why don't we call B plus H uh, F and we'll say that's F. All right. So that's what we're trying to do here. So let's I'm gonna do this also in Jupiter. So we switch. All right. All right, so first let's create um, the two reference frames that we need. So we're going to have uh, a B and an H. And um, we have this uh, B, C, H going to be a matrix and we've got row one is zero negative one zero row two negative one zero zero and row three zero comma zero negative B C Okay, and then B dot orient explicit with respect to 
H is going to be B, C, H transpose to make sure we match the correct syntax there, I think. And then we've got that established between the two reference strings. Now we can write some of the vectors that we have. So we're going to do um, MH. This is a skater, 84 kilograms. M, E, 9 kilograms. And uh, let's get uh, R from O to HO. 0 0.4 times B dot X minus 1.1 times B dot V. R from O to V O is 0 0.3 times B dot X minus 0 0.5 times B dot Z. So let's then calculate the location of the mass center from O, R from O to FO, the new mass center, is going to be um, mass B times R OBO plus R mass H times R HO all divided by the total mass in B plus H. So then that gives us the mass center with respect to O. Okay, looks reasonable. Okay. Yeah, and yeah. Okay, so we've got the mass, total mass center there. Let's um, enter in the central inertia dyadics. So we have I, H with respect to H, O. And I'll use the this inertia function as a little quicker to um, get your dyadics created if you just want to do it in one reference frame. And that's going to be in H. And then we give it the moments of inertia. Three, and then we do I uh, Y Z equals negative uh, one point seven. And then similarly, I B with respect to B O dot inertia in the B frame, and then we've got uh, zero point five, one point three. 0.8 is the moments of inertia, and then we have an I, uh, an XZ, an IX, IZX, that's going to be negative 0.1. Right, those should give us our two inertia dynamics, just to check to see what they look like. There we go. Should look like what I've written on the paper. All right, I think we've got everything defined. Now, the next thing, now we want to figure out the... Um, inertia okay so first we need to move the inertias from the individual ho and bo to the fo point okay and we'll do that with the parallel axis theorem so we need to calculate these i of um, ho with respect to fo right the new point and that's going to be um done like so so we we have our r o we need a r um h o to f o so let's let's create that first r uh, no, f o to h o is going to be Um, R O F O, if you know, minus R O H O. So then we can uh, take the magnitude squared of that R F O 
Joe. And maybe the easiest is just the dot product or application. Take the dot product. We're going to need a unit dyadic. So we need that outer x uh, hx hx plus we need that outer h dot y h dot y and plus we need that outer H dot Z, H dot Z. All right, so we've got a unit vector there. Now I did my dot product magnitude squared, and then I will multiply that by the unit vector U. And then I want to do the ME dot outer product of R. H of okay. I think that's got the cover. And that should give me this term. We're gonna have to start in. Invalid syntax. I have somehow deleted. Equals M H times. What did I do here? All right, I think that's right. That product times the new minus the outer product of the two vectors times H should give me the the bit that we need to shift things over here. And notice with the dyadics, right, I can I get these terms that are a mixture of H and B. If we express B, for example, we should get this uh, matrix that will shift things over for us. I'll just leave it like that. All right. So similarly, we want to calculate um, the one for B. So I'm going to copy that code. And we can just use the same one of those. But now we're going to do BO. 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 BO and then finally BO. All right, so these two terms will help us shift the H on the BO to the FO. So we can apply our parallel axis theorem now to get the two pieces. So we're going to have I of uh, FO with respect to, sorry, I of F with respect to FO. Uh, no, I of B with respect to FO. I'm not writing these right. These should be I of H with respect to FO and I of H with respect to FO, B with respect to FO, B. Oh no. Did have this right. Mm -hmm. All right. So boom, boom. Okay. So now what do I want to do? I want to write the. We got to write the parallel axis theorem twice because we have to shift both of these things, and then we sum up. Then we, then once then once we have them all about FO, we can sum them up to get the total new inertia. All right. So we then do. I of um, B with respect to FO 
it's going to equal i of v with respect to v o plus i of v o f I believe. Yes. And then similarly i of h with respect to f o equals i h v h o the central inertia plus the shift this term to shift it. Uh, H O F O, and we should get those two. And then if I just sum those together, I can get I of F with respect to F O, the central inertia diagonal of the whole combined body. I F All right. And then if I were to express this, and I'll just pick um, V for convenience. In v, we should get the new combined inertias, right? So we have larger X and Z due to adding this person, um, V uh, or X and Y which makes sense. The Z is still a small value but, not value, but a little larger. And then we have only the products of inertia on the off diagonals there, which are the Z and X. Okay, I think that's correct. Probably made a mistake, but you, uh, you all can uh, find that and let me know. But that's how you would use the parallax theorem. So just to recap, right, we shifted the inertias with respect to BO and HO to this new mass center FO, the combined mass uh, and mass distribution of both the objects. Once we do that, we can just sum them up, but we had to shift them by using the parallel axis theorem and, and creating these uh, terms that account for the distance shifted and how much inertia effects we would have in the inertia. All right, so I'll save that. And that closes this video. Um, so hopefully you can then solve the homework for this week. I'll see you in the next video.